Hey everybody, welcome back to Tim Travels. It's Terry, your host. Um, so, I have 1,651 subscribers as of a couple of minutes ago. I actually lost a couple after the last video. Go figure. Um, but, uh, 1651 was an interesting year. I mean, every year is interesting, of course, right? But in, um, couple things happened in 1651 that are that are kind of interesting first of all there were a couple of North Sea floods like tidal floods um, the first of which killed like drowned like thousands of people in Germany and then later that year about a month later actually Amsterdam was flooded so probably probably since then the Dutch have kind of been like hey uh, we need to do something about this North Sea and they started building dikes um, Something else happened that year, Leviathan. Um, Thomas Hobbes wrote Leviathan. Um, it is his kind of magnum opus. He had written other stuff on government and stuff, but in Leviathan, he basically concludes that peace and security are, it's necessary to have peace and security. Um, how do, I'm saying that wrong. In order for a society to have peace and security, it needs a strong central government. And he looked at three forms of government, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. And um, he decided that monarchy was best. Um, now, this is in the throes of the English Civil War. So Oliver Cromwell um, was the kind of dude in charge at that point so I, I don't know if Hobbes you know had he lived another 200 years would have still had the same opinion about monarchy um, and then another interesting thing happened in Massachusetts um, that year they passed laws that said people that were poor right people that were poor could not um, wear excessive forms of dress in other words um, and, and I don't know what they necessarily considered excessive, but, um, you know, it, it was interesting that it was based on somebody's wealth, um, a dress code based on somebody's wealth. So, you know, it's, um, it, it continues today, right? Like this class warfare, um, prejudgment about people based on what they wear, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. So, a um, couple of things, I, I just to correct the historical record. So, a couple of people pointed out to me, I said Stephen, the Apostle Stephen had been uh, crucified upside down. I was wrong. That was Peter that was crucified upside down. Stephen was stoned to death. Um, so, I'm guessing, you know, like Stephen wouldn't like a rock garden or whatever. Um, stoning was common then, and it's still a punishment in the world today um, in certain countries. The other thing that I would mention about stoning, and this goes to the time of Christ, uh, we all are, well, you may be familiar with the story of the woman taken in adultery. And um, these men are about to stone her to death because she's an adulteress. And Christ comes and basically says, hey, whoever is without sin, let them cast the first stone. Now, I've known of that story for, uh, you know, decades. I don't know when I first learned it. Um, but I had this epiphany recently <coughs> that, um, and by the way, I was raised Catholic. I went to Church of the Epiphany. Um, but anyway, I... I had this um, epiphany that, you know, not only were the men that were about to, you know, murder this woman um, unworthy to cast a stone at her, at her for her supposed sinfulness, I also, had, you know, I just... I just had this overwhelming feeling that at least one of her detractors, at least one of her executioners, if you will, 
um, had actually had sex with her, had had, um, you know, adultery, adulterous relationship with her. Because it couldn't, you know, it's not just single people, like if, if two single people in, in that society had sex, it was still a crime. So um, sex out of wedlock was, was prohibited. So um, it's just interesting to me that that whole thing, just a little bit about stoning. And of course then the, what happens is Christ, you know, all the men disperse. Christ, you know, asks the woman, where are thine accusers? And she's like, there are none. And so he just tells her to stand up and go on her way and sin no more. So anyway, that's, that's a little, um, little gospel lesson for you there. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it doesn't, like, things haven't changed, right? Like, honor killings of women haven't changed. And, you know, the, the irony of like a lot of people's hatred of the Muslim world is that, you know, Muslims oppress women, which of course is true. But, you know, what I would say to those people that are angry that Muslims oppress women and don't want, you know, women to have educations or to drive a car or anything, those are the same people that are complaining about women drivers or, you know, complaining about women in the workplace and, um, and and passing laws that take away women's rights so go figure right and and uh, like I said yesterday Christ Christ is probably the worst people in 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 Christ view are hypocrites so I just leave that thought with you so I'm a little bit salty about you know I well let, let me back up and say I I place a high high value on professionalism in the workplace regardless of what kind of workplace it is I don't care if it's a McDonald's kitchen or you know like I don't know a college or university or it's you know people that are you know running a hospital or a rocket building laboratory or whatever I place a high degree I place a high high value on professionalism and professionalism is kind of an all-encompassing term that in my mind includes um, you know how you treat people um, not just are you nice but do you treat people professionally like is there an absence of sexual harassment is there an absence of a toxic work environment, like bosses that are jerks just because they can be, etc.? Um, but it also includes treating people, um, treating people right in the workplace, and it includes, and this is where I'm going with this. It includes being competent at your job and not being an impediment to other people doing their jobs. So a few weeks back, I had this, I did this video about how I went to Tyson and um, I went to Tyson and it was supposed to be a drop and hook and the load wasn't even ready. Well, then I, you know, I was like, hey, I'm going to need to get a new appointment. And I didn't get an appointment. So I was like, okay, well, if I got no goal set for me right? Because an appointment is a goal, right? It's like something you want to accomplish. If I got no appointment set for me, then why am I even going to leave this truck stop? And so I eventually get to the place, but I have to wait another day. Now, some people are like, oh, well, you should have just kept driving because that that's on you. And some people even went as far as to say, I made Prime look bad. And I'm like, well, if Prime did look bad, it's not me. It might have been sales. It might have been dispatch, but it wasn't me. And it took them forever to get me a new appointment at Walmart. So anyway, and by the way, so as a follow-up to that, I eventually did deliver at Walmart, and that load was 
effed up. I mean, I had overages, shortages, and I even had an entire pallet. It was like 65 cases that Walmart didn't even order. Now, here's the here's the blessing that Walmart is. And by the way, I I always like going to Walmart distribution centers. I mean, I have I I can't think like once I had a Walmart driver be a jerk to me, but that wasn't really the distribution center. It was just him. He got mad because I, I couldn't tell which lane to be in on the way out, you know, and I was trying to avoid their scale. But anyway, um, so Walmart blessed their hearts, and I mean that dearly, truly. They took every bit of that overage right they didn't leave jack on my truck even that pallet of shit that they didn't want at all they just took it and i was so i was like oh you guys are awesome you know i told the lady i was like i really appreciate that and they had a special category for it or whatever but I, but anyway so you know so let me just say this i didn't do I, I did what I thought was appropriate and I certainly didn't do anything wrong. Maybe some people would have done it differently, but I think the outcome just proves my point of how effed up that load was because it's not the, and by the way, Tyson does so many food products that I don't want to, I don't want to like cast this really wide net because a lot of their places you just go, you pick up. It's ready, you know, it's ready when they say it will be, and you go there and it gets unloaded, bam, you're done, right? But I don't know what it is about the fresh meat poultry places, but I think, you know, the, the times that I've had problems with their loads, it's been fresh meat poultry places. Um, and really, is there anything you can do about it? No. I mean, you could just decline the load, but I don't necessarily, you know, you know, like Tyson per se, you know, is not somebody that I, you know, I'm like, no, I'm not going to take their stuff. Um, and certainly stuff going to Walmart is always going to be, I'm always going to be willing to take that. Um, because Walmart, and here's the word, Walmart people at the DCs are professionals. You might not always like how it goes, but they have a pretty dang good system and they always, every single person you deal with there knows what the hell they're doing, okay? They really do. So anyway, let's contrast that with another, and I don't even, and this company is not, I don't think ever a shipper or a receiver technically. They're just a warehousing company. And, you know, normally I wouldn't name them lineage, but I, you know, it, I don't, you know, after a while, it's not a coincidence. And you, um, you know, when you can, can sit, when they consistently at more than one facility, screw things up, you know, you kind of have to say it's the corporate culture and it's a culture of unprofessionalism. Now, maybe the people they hire, but in that, even that is part of professionalism. You hire good people and you pay them a, a good salary and you, you keep and attract good workers. And people that suck at their jobs, you move them on, right? You show them the door. That's professionalism. It's harsh sometimes, but it's professional. So let me, let me take you back like... It, it, it's been over a year now. I went to a, a facility of this company, Lineage, and um, I was supposed to have a drop and hook. And I was like, okay, cool, cause I got about, you know, I got about six hours on my clock, but I only need to go like 192 miles, right? I, I had to pick up an Allentown PA, and I had to run it up to like Schenectady, New York. Um, for a early, early morning delivery. So I show up and, you know, they're like, oh yeah, put your, put your, um, the guy says, well, 
your load's not quite ready. Kind of like Bob Euchre saying, missed it by that much. Um, your load's not quite ready. And so I'm like, okay, well, what do you want me to do? They're like, well, go down here to this lot and drop your trailer. And then um, you can go back under the trailer that's at door 52. And as soon as it's loaded, they'll, they'll, they'll come out with your paperwork. I'm like, okay, cool. So I back under the trailer at door 52. About two hours later, right? Now, mind you, you know, unless you don't have the product or you don't have enough workers or you're way behind or some other BS excuse, it doesn't take two hours to load a trailer, right? It just doesn't take that long. I mean, and and don't come at me because I'm a guy who worked at a freaking cross docking LTL company. I loaded and unloaded trailers all freaking night, night after night after night. Okay. And when you're putting stuff on a trailer, that's like you're just picking it and putting it. It doesn't take very long. I mean, two hours. If you had already started, like the guy said, you, you would be finished. So anyway, at about two hours after I backed under this trailer, guy comes out and he's like, hey, uh, the load you're, you're supposed to take is actually at door 56. I'm like, oh, okay, well, is it ready? Uh, no, they haven't started it yet. So anyway, long story short, by the time I get out of there, I've basically pissed away my whole clock, right? Now, I hadn't, you know, I hadn't split my sleeper, but that's beside the point, and here's why. Because it was supposed to be a drop and hook, and these guys were effed up like a soup sandwich. So anyway, that's, that's one story with them. Um, another time I delivered to them in Chicago, across the street from where I was the other day, and jacked up, jacked up, soup sandwich, right? So then I got a load even more recently when I did that trip that was jacked up there that I was saying that was when Paul was on my truck. So I got a load recently, so this is very recent, at a different facility lineage in Chicago and it was like 1900 or 2000 pickup on a Friday night. I go there, guess what they say? I go there on time, by the way. Guess what they say? Oh, this load was supposed to be picked up yesterday. We'll try to work you in. I'm like, oh, okay. So initially I was like, well, maybe sales is effed up, right? On that load, I was like, well, sales screwed this up. But here's what made me kind of change my mind. This last load that I took to, well, it's Bedford Park lineage um, in Chicago you know, outside of Chicago, it's right next to Chicago. I show up and they say, hey, um, you know, I give them the numbers, I give them the bills or whatever. And they said, hey, uh, this load was supposed to be delivered yesterday at 1100. Now I had an uh, 1130 appointment, so I got there at like 1055. They said, oh, this load was supposed to be delivered yesterday at 1100. But let me say this, that is a lie it's not a mistake it's not like somebody some miscommunications I am I am saying straight to their face it's a lie and here's why I really feel pretty strong about this I picked up this load on Wednesday at 1400 in Gaffney South Carolina door to door it's like 758 miles I'm solo right now. I don't have a co-driver. I can't believe that anybody at Prime would be like, oh yeah, he'll be able to make that load on time. He'll be able to get there by a... So basically, I picked up an hour. So... But I still would have had to get that load there in 22 hours. 22 hours hours and 758 miles with like 42,000 pounds for okay 
And so I was like, I cannot believe that anybody in prime sales would go, yeah, that's gonna fly, that's gonna work. This guy, and that's of course assuming I had, <laughs> I had a complete 11 hours to drive the first try, which I didn't, because obviously I drove to the shipper. Um, but yeah, there's no way that I was gonna get that done. I mean, even if I could drive 70 miles an hour, I just don't think you make you can get that trip done without violating your hours of service. Because you know, you say, okay, 70 miles an hour, so may, maybe I get, what, 660 miles? No, I'll take it back. S -s let's say 750 miles, okay? But I have to take a 10 hour break. Now maybe I can, you know, maybe everything goes swimmingly and I can get there, but it would be, it would be really tough. So I then, you know, and then the lady is like, oh yeah, so there's a $150 late fee. So I, I, I basically leave, I have to wait for a, you know, my, I said, what do you want me to do? My fleet manager's like, I'll send you an express code. So I get an express code for 150 bucks. I go back in, this is now three hours later or whatever after somebody decided what to do. I go back in and she's like, oh, I'll send you a link. She sends me a link and guess what, how much it's for? $153. Like she couldn't tell me that up front. That's lack of professionalism, right? And like I said, I honestly believe they're lying. And I think what happens is this, with big carriers, Prime, uh, Swift, Knight, um, who, you know, KLLM, Hirschbach, I think a lot of times, and, and it would not shock me, I'm not saying the lady that said it's late made that decision, that's, that's above her. But it would be very easy to program in a bogus arrival, you know, appointment, and when you know that you have a large carrier bringing a load, right? Because what do they know about large carriers? Large carriers have plenty of money, and they just want to get shit off their trailers, right? They just want their truck back on, back in service. So the large carrier will eat the 150 bucks. But if you do that 100 times a day, because these people have facilities all over the country, that's, <clears throat> that's 15,000 bucks a day in, in revenue that costs you zero to get, right? Like the return, the OR on that revenue is zero. Right, you spent zero, well, maybe it's, you know, 50 cents, right? It would not shock me that they actually are programming their systems to say that loads are late with large carriers. And who's gonna prove it, right? Like, no one's gonna, no one's gonna say anything about it. Well, I would, but. So anyway, <coughs> excuse me. I get, um, I finally, you know, I have to go park. I have to wait. I finally get this stupid trailer unloaded. And, you know, and, and at that time, I told my fleet manager, I don't ever want another load going to or from one of their facilities. Now, another driver told me they also own some other cold storage companies. <coughs> Sorry. But I haven't had problems with those other companies like this. Um, they seem to be more professional, more organized, etc. cetera. Um, they have a different culture. So I said, I don't want any more loads to or from that company. I don't care who the customer is. I don't want to pick up or drop at their facilities. What happens? I immediately get a pre-plan to, to pick up in Wisconsin and take it to another one of their facilities in Dallas Lineage, Texas. And I'm like, what did I just say? No, I don't want that load. So then 
on top of all of this other crap, right? They effed up the inside of the door of my trailer because this is a place where you back in with your doors closed and sealed. They opened the doors and they tore up the inside of the right trailer door. They tore off the insulation, the strip, the uh, riveted strip that kind of holds things together on the inside, they tore that all up. So then RA is like, oh, well you gotta take, I need you to take this trailer out to Manuka. And you know when I was out there, I did a, I did a video. Well, then, I, cause so I reject that one load. What do they do? They give me another load Oh, I take it back. Then they give me a couple loads I don't want because I'm trying to get to Springfield to pick up my trainee. And finally, when they do, you know, I, I finally called my trainee. I was like, look, man, I got to be home. And by the way, I'm, I'm bobtail now. I'm on my way home. Um, I got to get home. And so I don't think it would be, you know, it, it, it would be a waste of your time, a waste of my time to put you on the truck for like four days and have to drop you off somewhere while I'm home for four days. So he's like, yeah, that's fine. Cause on Monday, which would have been three days ago, I got to get my Twit card and then I could just go home. Right. And he lives up in Minnesota. And I said, cool. He goes, could you pick me up there? I'm like, absolutely. I, as soon as I come off of home time, I'll get a load going to Minnesota. I'll pick you up. So we're cool. But so then I say, okay, I tell, I tell dispatch what's going on, right? I send him a detailed message because I'm a detailed guy. That's how my mind works. I give them all explicit, you know, information. So then I get a load and I bring it to PA, okay? Tyson load, bring it to PA, goes fine. Um, so... I said, hey, um, if you got another load, I'll run it because I don't have to be home right this second. Um, and I said, but I need to go to, I need to go up to Pittston to get some stuff fixed. So, you know, I went up to Pittston. Well, then I get another load and it's a load and I don't even remember where it picked up but it was going to another facility of that same company. Now, so this is twice after I said I didn't want loads to or from them. Twice I get pre-plans to do that. And I'm like, is no one listening? I put this shit in writing. It's unprofessional when a driver says, hey, I don't want to do X. And you continue to... Like, I kind of joked about it on Lyle's channel recently. Like, hey, will you take this load? No. Like, a half an hour later, they offer you the exact same load. And you're like, no. And they're like, why? Because I don't feel like it. I, 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 got, I got tarot cards here, and I just start flipping them over to see which loads to take. Why do you care? I don't want it. But they already knew I wouldn't take load to this facility. So anyway, I'm like, they finally offer me a load. Now, mind you, I was available, available yesterday at like 1500. I'm in Pittston. I'm available. They give me a load that wouldn't pick up until tonight at Hershey. And it's going over to Costco in New Jersey. And I'm like, all right, I'll do it, you know make a couple extra bucks, I can still get home on the schedule that I wanted. So then this morning, they're like, uh, so apparently the computers are down at the 01, so we're gonna have to take that load off you. And then they offer me a load going to a place that I kid you not, it, it, I didn't, I've picked up at the, at the 01 before. I've never delivered to the 90, but I looked at the 90 and I couldn't even see where there were any trucks or loading docks or anything. And it was in Newark. It was like right in the city. And I'm not afraid to drive in cities. Um, I think the people that live in cities are more afraid to have me driving in their city than I am to drive in their city. But I was like, I don't even see where this is going. now. And I've delivered in the densely, densely populated um, places in northern New Jersey before, like where you're 
your front end of your truck is on like a street. People got to go around it. Like serious old school when people used to run, you know, they deliver in like 30 foot trailers or whatever. And these 53s, you know, and it's like super, super tight. You, you know the drill. So I was like, you know what? I don't want this load. It, I mean, it paid okay, like probably $253 a mile. But I was like, it, it, it's not wowing me. So I said, um, well, I don't want that load. So then this guy comes back to me that I actually, I hadn't heard of him before. Like I hadn't seen him before, I don't think. You know, his name. And he's all like, well, um, you know, our sales said you can just go home. And that kind of that kind of freaking rubbed me the wrong way for this reason. Sales doesn't get to say when I go home or not, right? Like as if I was waiting for sales to release me, okay? And you know, I know that um, I know that maybe it's just wording, but I was just like, eh, I don't really, I don't really care for that vibe. So then he says something, and he's like. He starts saying where I used to live, which I haven't, in that place I haven't lived for, well, at least since about a year since I changed my license. And I'm like, dude, I don't even live there. And then he starts asking me questions about what are you doing with your co-driver? I'm like, don't you guys talk to each other? Like, don't you read anything? Doesn't anybody keep track of anything? It's like, what do you guys do? I feel like I'm talking, you know, you know how when something happens and you see it on TV or you may have experienced yourself, right? It's like, uh, officer number one asks you a bunch of stuff and you tell them the whole story. Then about 20 minutes later, officer number two comes and they're like, hey, so I need to know what happened. And you're like, I just told this other cop. He's like, well, I, I need to hear it. He, you know, and, and then, you know, they're just looking for inconsistencies in your story a lot of times, but you know, it's just bullshit that they can't like talk to each other. Right? Like, why do I have to answer the exact same question like four times? Because four different people have no idea what the other people are doing, even though they're in the exact same organization with the exact same role. So I was just like, I, was, I told him, I said, don't you guys, like, what do you do? You guys are like a bunch of Kmart cashiers, right? Like, no one knows what's going on. Why am I answering these questions that I, that I answered days ago? You know, scroll up on your screen and read the shit that I sent you. Start being a professional. So then, you know, I'm just like, okay, screw it. And so I'm bobtailing home from Pittston, you know, and they're all like, well, where do you, you know, and he's then he's like, oh, did you tell HR you moved? Yeah, fuck yeah, I did. I sent him a copy of my new driver's license, all that stuff. You know, I know what I'm doing. And you guys can't even figure out, you know, it's like, so I'm just, I'm just really sick of the lack of professionalism at, you know, my own company, the people that should be looking out for me. And, you know, I know that a lot of trucking companies aren't any better. That's the pro that's the biggest problem in this industry. That that really is. There are so many trucking companies that hire the bottom feeders to interact with the very people that are the profit centers, right? And you wonder why companies have turnover? It's stuff like this. It's like, "Oh, you're more than just a number." but you're basically a number. And not only that, but we don't even read what you send us. We don't even give a shit enough to like read what you're saying, unless it's right in front of us and we gotta make a decision. But a day later, we've forgotten about everything. You know, we don't even know where the fuck you live or what state you're licensed in. 
you know, and that's unprofessional. And I'm, you know, Prime is not the only company that, that this happens at. It happens at a lot of them, you know. But the one thing I will say about Knight, you know, I knew my fleet manager, like, I've met my, I've met my fleet manager at Prime once face-to-face -face because I had to seek him out, okay? And, you know, Prime has a different system. But my, my driver manager at, at, um, at night, I saw that guy every single time I went home. Every single time I was in my own terminal, I saw him. I knew the terminal manager. I could call those guys directly, you know. But, I, but also at night, I had the business, I had num, numbers, including cell phone numbers, for, for senior executives, people that were over like huge sections of the country or people that were the the vice president for driver relations. You know, these people, when, when I went to headquarters, I met the CEO, the CFO, all these people, they passed out business cards. They're like, hey, hey you got a problem, you call me. You know, if you can't get it resolved, you call me. And so I hope somebody, you know, in sales or, you know, in operations, maybe watches this. Because I can't be the only driver that's getting treated this way. Although I might be the only driver, I'm not the only driver that speaks out about it either. But I want Prime to be better, right? I don't want to leave Prime. Because I, you know, I, I, I know the grass isn't greener on the other side of the fence. There might not even be grass. It might be dirt. I want to stick around. But, you know, I, I also have the personality that once I'm done, I'll go somewhere even if I don't think it's better just because I want a change of scenery. And, you know, my lease is coming up in, um, a, a, well, actually six months, probably almost six months to the day from now, my lease is coming up. And I certainly am considering buying a truck at Prime, but... You know, there might be, you know, there's going to have to be something that persuades me to stay at Prime. Now, maybe my driver manager has too damn many people because I know he has about 100 drivers. Although, candidly, when I was in the military, I, you know, like, I had a, I had a company of midshipmen of 136 midshipmen, and there was just me and one other person. And we seem to manage okay, you know. I mean, there was a chain of command, and I had midshipman leadership too. But ultimately, you know, like when when somebody needed to go on leave, I had to sign. I had to sign the request. You know, the farther up the chain you are, the more burden falls on you. But if you can't handle the burden, then what you need to do is just be honest about it and say, "Hey, I need to," you know. I need to cut the size of my fleet because if I'm out here earning money that's making my fleet manager wealthy, then I expect service. I'd rather go to a fleet manager who's new, who maybe doesn't know the system quite as well, but is way more responsive, you know, and, and give them a chance. You know, the other day I needed a freaking express code. It took, I sent two messages um, I called, got disconnected, called again. Finally, I called driver lineup because I didn't know who the hell to talk to. I didn't know if my fleet manager was even getting my messages. And finally, after over an hour, like I was unloaded. They're like, uh, do you, can you pay us? Can you pay us? And I kept saying, no, I can't, <laughs> you know, finally it took over an hour to get an express code. And this is during the work day. This is not in the middle of the night. Over an hour to get an express code. And, you know, like I said, I crave professionalism and I'll try to find it wherever I can. Um, and if I can't find it at Prime and Prime's not willing to like make adjustments to become more professional, and you know, maybe this isn't the place for me. Maybe, and you know, realistically, <clears throat> Maybe I'm just going to go until I decide to quit driving, um, being 
being slightly unhappy all the time. Because maybe, maybe there's no one in this industry that is truly professional. You know, all these people, all these back office people are just punching clocks. They don't really give a crap. The second, you know, they can, they walk out the door. They don't care if they've left you stranded. They're like, oh, someone else will take care of it. It's someone else will clean up the mess. That's what it always seems to be like. And, you know, um, it, it really, it really kind of fatigues you. So anyway, thanks for listening to my rant. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm not down on prime as much as I'm down on the system. And I, I, and you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just naive because honestly, since I retired from the Navy and I'm not saying my retirement triggered this, but the Navy has been just effed up and I could, I could sit here and list at least 20 examples of humiliation, unprofessionalism, just mind boggling F ups that I can't even get my head around as a as a former professional sailor so maybe maybe this is just how the world's going and I'll just have to endure it till I die and uh, when I get on the other side of the of, of things I can talk to people that died before me that will be a sympathetic ear anyway take care and I'll talk to you soon bye